Cool. My name is Manabu Sumida, Ekimi University, a uh, host of this session. Uh, we are honored to invite Professor Margaret Sutherland to be our keynote speaker today. Uh, before her speech, please allow me to introduce Professor Sutherland. Dr. Margaret Sutherland is Professor of Higher Beauty Studies and Inclusive Practice. She is Director of Partnerships, Communication and External Engagement and Director of the Scottish Network for Able Pupils at the University of Glasgow, Scotland, UK. She is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She serves as Treasurer on the Executive Committee of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children and the European Council for High Ability Accreditation Committee for the European Talent Support Network. She has written articles in the field of high ability and is the author of Gifted and Talented in the Early Years, a practical guide for three to six year olds and developing the gifted and talented young learner. Her first book is now in its second edition and has been translated into German and Slovenian. She has 40 years teaching experience in mainstream primary schools, behavior support and uh, literary in high, higher education. And so her work in uh, preliminary concerned with learning, teaching and pedagogy. Margaret is on the editorial board of the Korean Educational Development Institute Journal of Educational Policy, Journal for the Education of the Gifted, Journal for Educating Young Scientists and Giftedness, and the editor uh, Editorial Advisory Board for the Journal of Research in Special Educational Needs, British Journal of Research in Special Educational Needs and Support for Learning. She reviews papers for higher ability studies, European Journal of Teacher Education, Adults and uh, Continuing Education, a British Educational Research Journal, the British Journal of Religious Education. She regularly gives keynote addresses at conferences and has led courses, workshops and seminars across the UK and has been invited to work with staff and students in Africa, Europe, Australia, China, and North America. We miss her in Japan. So the, now we are going to move on to the speech titled The Policy Practice Nexus, uh, Bridging the Gap Between Rhetoric and Reality. Professor Sutherland, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you very much. And I'm so sorry that I haven't been in Japan and I have never been in Taiwan either. So I'm very sorry that we are not able to meet in person today, but I'm honored to have been invited to take part in this conference. And I'm so grateful that we have the technology that allows that to happen, even although we can't be together in the room. So thank you very much for your introduction and thank you to the organizers of this conference. Organizing a conference is always challenging, but when you're doing it um, online as well, it brings additional challenges and the support of everybody has been wonderful. So thank you so much. So you've heard a little bit about me and I think and I hope that one of the things you would hear through my, my 40, my goodness, is it really that long? That 40 plus years of, of working is there's a, there's a thread that goes through. And that thread is about teaching, teachers, learning children in schools, in the classroom. And much of my work has been guided by um, two words, I suppose. And those two words are, so what? Um, because as a teacher and then as a teacher educator, I ask myself, OK, so what? So what do I do? I read about a model or I read about a theory 
or I hear about something and I think, okay, so what do I do in my classroom? And this morning I want, or it's morning for me, it's afternoon in Taiwan and wherever I can see on the, in the list with people from all over the globe. So whatever time of day it is with you, for the next little while, I'm going to share some thoughts and um, share some of the work that we've been doing here in Scotland. So just give me a minute and let's hope the technology, um, I can work it here, just a second. So hopefully what you're seeing now are my, are we all right? We're, we're good to go. So you've heard the title, this idea of a nexus. A nexus is something that joins and connects. And I'm looking at this gap between what we say and then what it looks like and how can we have, what can we do in that bit in the middle? That's where my work has been and it's what I'd like to share with you today. So let's just get this working. Here we go. So I currently am sitting, I'm looking out of my window. It's a beautiful sunny morning here. It's not always like that in Scotland, but today it's absolutely beautiful. And that's my university tower that you can see there. And uh, we have a slogan about being world changers. And I'm going to talk about that a little later in my presentation. Um, but just, just a little bit of background. So here I am in Scotland. Scotland is one of the four nations that makes up the United Kingdom, with the other three being Wales, Northern Ireland, and England. And I'm in the, the northern part there in Scotland. And just have a look at that map and where are you just now? Where are you sitting? How far away are we from each other geographically? But how close are we connected through technology and also through our interest and our love of the field of gifted education? Why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm telling you all of this because I think it's important to think about where we are, because where we are has an impact on us as researchers, as educators, as teachers. It, it matters where we are. There's a map there of Scotland. You can see we're a very jaggy coastline there. We have lots of islands and just a few facts about Scotland. We're not very big in terms of population. There's only about, they reckon just now in July 2022, about five and a half million of us. So we're not a big country. Um, we have had a number of Nobel Prize winners and the chemistry Nobel Prize winner was actually a Scot and he visited my university just in the last few weeks to open a big new research building that we have. And I was just so delighted to hear him speak because he said, I would not be standing here with my Nobel Prize medal winning, uh, winning this Nobel Prize without my teacher. And he attributed his success to his chemistry teacher who started him on the road. And it's things like that that get me excited. It's things like that that make me get up in the morning and want to learn more and to think more about teachers and teacher education because the difference we can make as a teacher is huge. So back to Scotland. Edinburgh is our capital city. And if you haven't been to Scotland and if you come, do come and visit our, our city. It's a beautiful castle, many old buildings too for you to see. Scotland um, is interesting insofar as we're currently limited to self-government within the United Kingdom with Westminster. And if you've been following the news, Westminster has been in the news a lot, particularly yesterday. But um, we're governed by Westminster over certain things about taxes, social security, defence. But in other matters, we have a Scottish Parliament with our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who's a graduate of my university, the University of Glasgow. And we have our own laws in relation to health to law itself and also importantly for this session in education. So sometimes when you read in books or in articles and it says in the UK, blah, 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 
actually it often means in England, it doesn't mean the UK, because there are differences in our education systems. Again, why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm telling you this because I love this quote from Alexander, who says that no educational policy or practice can be properly understood except by reference to the web of inherited ideas and values, habits and customs, institutions and world views that make one country, <coughs> excuse me, distinct from another. In other words, the title of the slide there, what makes us, us? What makes us in Scotland? And it's important because when I come to share the work that I'm doing, it's within this context of Scotland. And I'll share a little more about that in a minute. I love the way Alexander has written that sentence there because he talks about this web. And in Scotland, in the spring and in the autumn, I love going out in a slightly frosty morning where the dew has come down on our bushes and they're sparkling with the dew drops. They're maybe crystallised in ice and the spiders have all been out and their webs are over the bushes and they are works of art. They are beautiful, sparkling in the morning sunlight. And when we think of that web of inherited ideas and values, habits and customs and so on, when it's a sparkly, shiny web like that, that web is a thing of beauty. But I've also witnessed these webs when a fly has been caught in them and it's struggling to get out and it can't. It's stuck, it's caught. And so there's a little dichotomy here where the web of our inherited values. There can be good things about our inherited values, etc. But it can sometimes stop and inhibit and put a lid on things for us too. So there's a, a something to watch in there. It is what makes us us, but we need to be aware that sometimes what makes us us can hold things back. And we know in gifted education too talks about these differences. This quote here, education for the gifted is interwoven with a country's philosophical and political views, its cultural history and its economic base. These pictures here of Scotland, the one with the sunrise there in the bottom is, the, is Glasgow. That's the River Clyde that runs through the city of Glasgow. It used to be heavy industry, shipbuilding went out all over the world. Not anymore, it's changed. That's not what we do. So all of this has impacted on our education system and in how we view and think about gifted education too. I want to take you on a little bit of a journey with me though. This is my university. This is the University of Glasgow, all lit up in all its splendour one evening when I came out from working with some teachers. And I want to take you um, to a mythical place. I want to take you to a place called Brigadoon. Perhaps you've seen the 1954 movie called Brigadoon. Brigadoon is the story or the legend of a mythical village in the Scottish Highlands. And the lady in the yellow and the gentleman in the green shirt, they're Americans and they were visiting Scotland and they happened upon this mythical village. Rigadoon is quite enchanted. It's kind of caught in a time lapse and it's unchanged and invisible to the outside world except for one special day every hundred years. And this is when these two American visitors arrived. <coughs> excuse me, arrived. It was the special day and the village appeared out of the mist. But once you've entered the village, if you leave, then the miracle is broken and it would mean the end for them all. And we'll talk in Scotland about this idea, oh, that's just like Brigadoon, this mythical place that kind of doesn't really exist, this perfect kind of place. Why am I telling you that? Well, I'm telling you that because if you remember in my title, I've got this idea about the rhetoric, what we say. And we've got this lovely mythical village here in Scotland. And we do have highlands and islands and lochs and kilts and scenery that you would expect. We have all that 
But equally in Scotland, we have poverty. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation released statistics last year. It's not something that we are proud of here in Scotland. But if we look at the statistics there, if you're living in an area, a deprived community in Scotland, you're 18 times more likely to have a drug related death than if you're living in an area that's not a deprived area. You're four times more likely to have an alcohol related death. Death by suicide, three times the rate in least deprived areas. And following the pandemic, um, there's more than double those in the least deprived areas in terms of death rates. So we have a problem in Scotland. Yes, we have the mythical Brigadoon, but the reality is somewhat different. These are not statistics that I'm proud of, but these are statistics that I believe we need to challenge, we need to change, and I believe that education is one of the ways that we can do that. Males born in the most deprived areas can expect about 25 fewer years in good health. So this isn't just about the end of life, this is about the quality of life. Where there's alcohol dependency in families that will impact on children and these children come into our schools and I do believe that we have children in deprived areas, children coming out of households living in poverty who are and could be with the right support and help in their schools they could be gifted and talented. We need to think about this as we are thinking about gifted and talented education. For me, this nexus, this joining part, we have to join with the bigger picture when we're beginning to think about gifted education. If we solely focus on gifted education, then I think we are missing something. So the rhetoric, the brigadoon versus the reality and the poverty. But I want to use those two kind of images and this notion of rhetoric, what we say, and then the reality of what it's like in practice. Um, come, come with me with those two ideas. Hold on to those as I go through the rest of my presentation. So in Scotland, as I said, we have our Scottish government based in Westminster. This is our government building designed by a Spanish architect. It's very unusual. If you come to Edinburgh, you can visit our building. It's a, a really interesting building inside and out. And of course, interesting things take place inside. And one of the interesting things about Scotland and the way Scotland um, operates is that it works by having consultations if you go on to the Scottish Government website, there's always consultations being run by the government. They want to know people's opinions. They want to know what the, um, what, what the, the person in the street thinks about things. And so currently, for example, I'm coordinating a response from my education to a consultation that is out about our assessment system. Our education system is changing. We've gone through um, sort of reforms and so on. We've had the OECD in looking at what we've been doing, making recommendations. And one of the things we want to look at is assessment. And so as an institution, we are responding to that consultation because the government is very interested in research. It wants to know what is happening, what are the latest cutting edge things that we need to think about when we're developing policies and how can we connect all of that together? And we had a big debate. In fact, we're going to, this is part, the, the consultation is part of a big national conversation we're, we're having in Scotland. And there was a national conversation not that long ago about, uh, about Scotland as a place. And it reaffirmed that we want to build a sustainable, fair society. And that's something that's important, I think, as we think about what does that mean for gifted education? Um, because the government recognised and acknowledged that in wanting to become this sustainable and fair society, education had a very important part to play in that, particularly around improving social justice and equality for young people. And for me, that's exciting when I come to think about gifted education too. 
The other thing the government um, reaffirmed was that they are committed to inclusive education is a key government priority in our increasingly diverse society. Like many countries, we are welcoming asylum seekers and refugees. And although that is uh, governed by Westminster and Scotland can't always operate perhaps in the way it might want to around asylum seekers and refugees, we welcome them to Scotland. And indeed, we call them new Scots. And we welcome them with the customs, the values, the ideas and habits, all that thing in that Alexander quote. We welcome them with those to our communities, believing that they make us a richer country, a, a better country to be in. Teachers need to be well prepared and adequately supported, though, if they're to sustain and develop inclusive practice. And I think if you spoke to teachers in Scotland, they would have no trouble with those first three bullet points, but they would say at the bottom one, yes, that's the rhetoric. But what has happened in reality? Does that bear out in practice? Have we been sustained and supported? Well, one of the things we're trying to do, and I think this is really interesting for, for gifted education, one of the things we're um, doing is we have standards. We have the General Teaching Council for Scotland and we are thinking and, and, and working through what being a teacher means. What is teacher professionalism? And we in the rhetoric say that teachers have potential to transform and have a profound impact in the learning experiences and life chances of our children and young people and have a critical role in helping them to achieve positive outcomes so that when they leave education, they're going out into the world to contribute to society, to be um, good citizens in society and to, to build up our country. And at the heart of this is the idea of professional values and teacher professionalism. And when I've been working with these um, guidelines and these um, the, 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 the uh, standards that teachers have to meet, when I work with our initial teachers, when I'm working with teachers who are already qualified and I'm talking to them about gifted education, I'm talking to them about gifted learners in their classes and in their schools. I come back to this, for example, saying, look, you have the potential to transform and have a profound impact on the learning experiences and life chances of children and young people. And if you're not thinking about gifted children, then you're letting some of our children down. So this idea of teacher professionalism and the way it's constructed and written about within our legislation and within our standards is very helpful when I am working with teachers. And when we think about teaching, what does it mean to be a teacher. Well, for us, and linking back, remember to the, the, the commitment the Scottish Government has made, the um, standards pick up on some of those ideas. And you can see three here three pillars that we are building um, the, our education and our teacher education around. The idea of social justice, respect and integrity. And I strongly believe that whether you are a teacher of gifted children, a teacher of children who are struggling, a teacher of children who are autistic, whatever, if you are a teacher, then I think these three pillars, certainly here in Scotland, for where we are in our history, for where we are in terms of our education, these are three good um, rocks to build on. Social justice, that view that everyone deserves equal economic, political and social rights and opportunities now and in the future. And well, you will know if you're around the field of gifted education for any length of time, that one of the arguments often made is that, well, these young people are, are fine, they're clever. They don't need us to, they'll go on in spite of us. We don't need to think about them. Well, actually, we know that that's not true. 
And so if we're talking with teachers, then bringing them back to this idea of, well, if you're going to be a teacher, you need to think about social justice, about rights and opportunities, then this works well for gifted children. Respect. Trust and respect are expectations of positive actions that support authentic relationships um, and show and care for the needs and feelings of the people involved. We know what happens to gifted children if they don't get their, or can happen to some mm -hmm. gifted children if they don't get the support that they need in class, if they're not challenged. Many of you will, will be familiar with the work of my friend and colleague Tracy Cross at the College of William and Mary, <coughs> excuse me, in America, where he's looked at that connection between giftedness and suicide, for example. So we know that relationship building, showing we care for the needs of young, young people and the feelings of young people, we know that's really important. And also in Scotland, we're very concerned about sustainability, about the sustainable development goals. So showing respect too for our natural world and our limited resources, how can we build all of these things in to our being as a teacher? Important, I think, for everybody. And of course, then for gifted young people. And integrity, the practice of being honest and showing a consistent and uncompromising adherence to a strong moral and ethical principles and values. Hugely important. And I believe with that as a bedrock of how we approach gifted education, that would make a huge difference to much of what goes on in the field of gifted education. So, being a teacher in Scotland has its roots in social justice, respect and integrity. More rhetoric. Having made its position clear about inclusion, inclusion and society and equality and respect and social justice, we have a whole series of um, acts and guidance and policies in Scotland that start actually from pre-birth right the way through. That notion of joined upness, where these policies sit and fit together. So all of these policies are completely applicable, as they should be for our gifted young people in schools. The getting it right for every child, GERFEC, getting it right for every child. Well, if we don't include our gifted young people within that, then we're not getting it right for every child, we're only getting it right for some. And so the rhetoric around this is good. We, we have, I would argue, good policies in Scotland. Many of these policies, if you read them, gifted children, gifted young people are there within them. But it depends what lens you're looking through. If you're not thinking about these children, if you're not actively seeking out and saying, well, what does that mean for gifted learners in my school or in my class, then they can sometimes slip through the cracks and be ignored. So the rhetoric is there, but we need to ensure that the reality um, is, is also there and reflected in what we do. And I'll say more about that in a little minute. So we have the Scottish Government's view, we have the policy enactment, we have the teacher standards where we're saying here's how you can, the things you should be if you're going to be a teacher. And I am arguing in, in all of that rhetoric, in all of the policies and the discussions, etc. Gifted education absolutely has a place there. It absolutely allows us to meet the needs and to think about and support gifted young learners and their families. The legislation and the policy to our Education Act, the Standards in Scotland School Act in 2000, talks about developing talents and allowing children to develop talents to their full potential. Now, I'll come back to that phrase, full potential, <coughs> in a minute. But that act clearly applies to gifted children. And that's a piece of legislation. That is the law. Schools have to do that. In 2004 and updated in 2009 and then 2016, 
we have the Additional Support for Learning Act. This act had myself and my colleague dancing round our offices because this act specifically mentions, as we would call it in Scotland, high ability, or as many places in the world would call it, the gifted and talented. It specifically mentions them. It was in 2004 that Scotland did something that I think certainly at the time was a different way of viewing this. There are a few other places have, have and other countries are starting to think in this way. But Scotland at this point said we're going to stop talking about special education and special educational needs. And we're going to start to think about barriers to learning. What stops young people accessing learning? And they recognised within that there can be all manner of things that will stop young people accessing learning. And the reason that we were doing a happy dance round our office is because that act recognised that being gifted and talented may in fact put a barrier if the curriculum and learning is not right. It also allowed us to think about multiple or twice exceptional um, uh, children as well. Because we were no longer thinking in silos, we are sort of autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic and, and separating children out. We were standing back, it was a philosophical, different way of looking at things and saying, okay, we have all these diverse learners in our schools and classes, how can we support them? What can we do? So there was ideas of universal support, because we all need support at some point or another. And then this idea of targeted support. And again, important because it's an act that places a duty on schools, education authorities. When you find a child who is not accessing things the way they should be, it places a duty on the schools and the teachers and the authority to do something about that. So that was very exciting time for us. Children and Young People Act in 2014, that was part of this getting it right for every child policy that I mentioned in that last slide. Well, as I said, if that's not about gifted and talented, then it's not getting it right for every child. So again, I would argue we have this powerful rhetoric of what's the reality. Parents, teachers and young people that I've worked with recently, you can see what the reality is there. And that will be, some of these comments will be very familiar to many of you, where the, the parent went along to parents' night and was told that the child had hit the ceiling on the test. And the parents said, well, do they get another test? Because that's not actually measuring what they can do. That's not measuring how far they can go. That's simply saying they've reached what that test is measuring. They've hit the ceiling. Another parent sharing that all they can talk about are the things that she can't do. In this particular instance, it was about the child's handwriting. She had wonderful ideas, her mind was racing, she had problems with motor skills, her, her hand couldn't keep up with her thoughts, but they weren't so concerned about the amazing things and connections she could make and the reading she could do. They were worried about the things she couldn't do. So although we've got this rhetoric that says we're not thinking in terms of difficulties and special education and so on, the practice, the reality is still sometimes got a way to go to catch up. We've never had a child like this before, a school told me. Well, maybe they have and they didn't know they had had a child like this before. Another school said to me, we're actually unsure how to get it right for this child, for him or her. Now, that was actually an encouraging conversation. It was encouraging because they wanted to get it right. They were thinking about getting it right for every child. But when it came to this gifted child that they had, they weren't sure how to get it right for him. But they were asking the question. They were seeking out the information. They were trying to find out how they could get it right. Although um, there is, of course, no one right way to get it right for a gifted child. So the children, young people, when you speak to them, and we've been doing a lot of speaking to young people during and just after the lockdown learning they had been doing at home, and they said, you know, the work's not that difficult. 
I finish my work quickly and then I just get some more. These, of course, are not um, unique to Scotland. You've been around gifted education, you will have heard these complaints. But they show very nicely, I think, that we have this good rhetoric. But unless teachers are thinking about and doing something in that gap in the middle, the nexus part, joining up the, the what we know and then what we do, then the reality is very, very different. However, we need to be careful and not assume that it's all bad. Because also I've had teachers and parents and young people tell me that the school have done a brilliant job in challenging him in mathematics. The teacher really gets my child. It's made such a difference. Moving from one year to the next, the rhetoric is the same rhetoric, but the reality can change when a teacher gets the child. They get gifted children. They understand what they're doing, how they're learning, and they get that they need to do something and react to this child, these children. Schools telling me we're thinking about this group of learners and it's part of our raising attainment policy. Many of the schools that I work in, mainstream schools, are thinking about how can we think about this group of learners? They're just here. They're, we've got them. We need to think about how we do them. And of course, the rhetoric allows the schools to do that. Getting it right for every child. It's many schools now looking at how they can develop a getting it right for me plan. And I've been working with a, with a few schools who have been developing these getting it right for me plans. A wonderful opportunity to take that rhetoric and to turn it into reality so that it is indeed getting it right for every child through a getting it right for me policy, a plan for the child. So it looks at what um, targets the child will have, it monitors their progress, it's helpful for the teacher, it helps them to guide them to know where to take the children in their next steps with learning. We've talked to young people where they're still in our primary schools, but they are working two plus years ahead in mathematics, for example, and the maths teacher comes from the high school each week, works with the child, works with the school. And of course, they are working with that child, but they're producing a bank of resources. They're raising attainment generally within the school for other individuals too. So great opportunities. Um, and another group that um, a, a very high label group in a school who have been working on a course in leadership skills. There's a lot of, of um, rhetoric around leadership and gifted education. I don't know that I think all gifted people will go on to be leaders. I think some will. I think there are many qualities that we need to look at around ideas of areas of leadership. But this school, one school in particular, had talked and worked with these young people about leadership skills. So here's an example where the rhetoric and the reality actually do come together. They're working in that nexus and trying to provide. What's the, the, the common thread through actually all of the slides that I've shared with you so far? Well, I would argue that the common thread through all of these and the thing that makes the difference is the teacher. A lot hangs on the teacher in terms of turning rhetoric into reality. And as was said at the beginning, I spend a lot of my time working with teachers. I was a teacher, I've worked in higher education, and predominantly my work in higher education has been with teachers. A teacher, very powerful position to be in, a position of great responsibility. The teachers can't do it alone. And that's where, for me, I think it's hugely important that we think about how we work together. I don't know what you do um, in, in terms of your work. I don't know if you're here and attending this conference because you're a teacher, because you're a researcher, because you're, uh, sorry, the message popped up in my screen. Oh, it's gone. Um, sorry, I think, hoping things are still okay. Um, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent, whether you're a gifted young person, I don't know why you're here. 
I do believe that if we can all work together, then we're going to make things better within gifted education. And to do that, I think we need to talk to each other, we need to listen to each other, and we need to understand where each other are coming from. Okay, something has happened here to my presentation. And I'm not sure why that's lit up. Here we go, sorry. Um, Actually, I'm going to go back just for a minute because I would like to take a minute just to pause and I'd like you to think. Um, I would like you just to think for a minute. I said at the beginning, we had a slogan in my university, we talk about being world changers. Now, for some, it was our chemistry graduate who's gone on to be a Nobel Prize winner, who has done wonderful things that might indeed change our views and, and work in the world. But we're not all going to be that. And I said once to one of the teachers who was graduating, I said, what are you going to do to be a world changer? And she said, oh, my goodness, Margaret, um, I'm just going to change the world one child at a time. So I'd like just to pause and just for a minute. I've been talking for quite a long time now. So I'd like to pause and just for a minute, give you a chance to sit wherever you are in the world and think, what are you doing within gifted education? to be a world changer. Not necessarily the big things, but the little things that collectively will help to change our world. So I'm just going to stop speaking for a minute and give you a minute to think and reflect on that. see somebody's joining we're just having a minute of reflection to think about how we're changing the world with our work it might be part of the gifted world it might be part of the general world the bigger world it might be in your country it might be simply in your school Let's think then about the teacher and let's think what this means for us involved in gifted education. Many countries in the world, probably actually almost all countries in the world, are interested in how we can develop high quality learning and teaching. As we're embracing diversity and helping talents to bloom, as the title of this conference says, then Teaching, high quality teaching and learning is going to be an integral part of that, a very important part of that. And children and young people have a right to high quality of education. But often that's very challenging in many countries and particularly in countries of political strife, poor economic conditions, um, where this aspect of life is deteriorating. And, and I think in those countries, in many countries where that's happening, then it's a considerable waste of, of human talent and abilities. We are not indeed embracing the diversity. We are not helping talents to bloom. And I think as we look globally, gifted education needs to start to think, if we're not already, about some of these big issues that we're facing within education. UNICEF estimates that more than two and a half million children have been internally displaced within Ukraine, a particular situation um, here in Europe. Um, in fact, there's probably more than that now because that was the statistics in March. The true toll is likely to be much higher. That's going to have a profound impact on the young people affected, on the countries that those young people have arrived in, and on education. And what are we doing about the gifted young people within that cohort of children who are now displaced and who are arriving in countries having been through trauma. It's not just a situation unique to Europe. My goodness, this is going on across the world in many places. The United Nations saying that at least 82.4 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes. Amongst that, nearly 26.4 million refugees, around half of whom are under the age of 18. 
if we're thinking about high quality learning and teaching, it might be in your classroom tomorrow, but we also need to think about what we are doing in the field of gifted education that ensures there is not this considerable human waste. Because if we're not getting it right for these young people as they join us from these traumatic situations, then I worry actually about us as a, a world. I talked and I'm talking about this nexus, this idea of joining, connecting, linking, tying, a yoke that joins us together, a knot, a bond, a connection, a core. These are strong words that, in terms of what nexus means. And the opposite of that, of course, is separation and division and dissection and breaking up. And if we're going to bridge that gap between things that we say and write about and read about and policies that are good. And if we're actually going to have a, make a difference in the reality in the classroom and in the experiences, whether that's for these displaced young people I've been talking about, or whether it's for, for your neighbor's child or your own child, then it's by working in that nexus. It's by linking and connecting the research, the policy, the practice and saying, well, what does that mean in our classroom? The so what question that I mentioned at the beginning, that's where we will start to bridge that gap, I believe, and start to make a difference. So that's where I've been working. That's where I've spent my time trying to join these dots or hexagons or whatever shape you wish, trying to make these things come together in order that we can raise attainment, challenge young people, gifted young people in appropriate ways. We've just published the third edition of the National Framework for Inclusion. One of the unique things about that work that we've been doing here in Scotland is that it's brought all the initial teacher education institutions together. That is unique because often universities are in competition with each other for students, for producing the best research, but we've come together acknowledging that if we want our teachers to enter our teaching, the teaching profession, then we need to work together in order to ensure they are entering the profession thinking about all learners. You can see the institutions there that came together to work on this framework. The framework is ideally placed for thinking about gifted education. We want, it's a series of questions to challenge schools, to get schools and teachers to think about their practice, the so what are you doing question. We ask them to start by reflecting on their strengths, identifying the issue, excuse me, or problem that's to be solved. And in the field of gifted education, that's often around curriculum, it's often around are they going to stay in the class? Are they going to join an older group? Are we going to grade skip, accelerate? All the, the issues that we're very familiar with in the gifted field. We're going to help teachers to browse the questions, to really help them think about their practice, to reflect on the question, to work, to resolve the issue that they've identified, and then to come back and that continuous process of reflection. The being a teacher in Scotland, the standards that I mentioned earlier, we have standards that recognise that, that things change. Your understanding changes, your experience changes as you go through the career trajectory. And so the questions in this document are based around initial teacher education. What do you need to think about when you're just starting? What do you need to think about when you're in the job and you've been doing it for a while? And what do you need to think if you're an experienced teacher, if you're a head teacher and a manager? How do you work through these questions? And again, these questions were developed by a group of experts. Um, I was there with my expertise in gifted education. There were people there with expertise in autism, in dyslexia, bilingualism, a whole range of um, um, experiences that came together in order to develop these questions. So how well do I know my learners? That's a fundamental question I think for students and it's particularly interesting when we start to talk about gifted learners because I've worked with teachers who told me I didn't know they could do that. They weren't thinking about how well do I know my learners? Another very important question for beginning teachers are some of my learners more valued than others? So when schools say, well, they'll be fine, they're clever, we don't need to think about them. 
they're actually making a value judgment there because I value, I'm looking at those learners that I think might be disadvantaged. I think they need more help. Well, actually, no, if we're thinking about everybody getting it right for every child, then we need to think about our gifted learners too. So a series of questions that um, build on each other and develop and, and, and develop more complex thinking as we're going through our um, professional career. We acknowledge that there's professional knowledge and understanding that teachers require pedagogical theories and practices. What, what do you rely on? That really allows us to challenge ideas of um, special education, ideas of, um, of categorizing children, ideas of putting ceilings and limits on children's learning. Next stage along, how do I do I understand how the strengths and limitations of different approaches influence and impact and limit learners learning and participation? A gift of a question if you're in a school and working with teachers, getting them to think about these learners that you and I here at this conference are so passionately interested about. Experienced teachers, teachers who are managers, who are organising learning in schools, are labels and categories sufficient in capturing learners' lived experiences on multiple identities? And what alternatives do we have? So you can see these questions building on complexity. And as you look at these questions, I would argue they are good questions for teachers to be asking and thinking about in order that they can develop inclusive practice that includes gifted learners because if it doesn't include them it's not inclusive it's exclusive professional skills and abilities well again look at that first question there there are many more questions i've selected only some but look at that question there for student teachers what groups of learners may be excluded from my classroom and learning context and traditionally, people go to the children who can't read, the children who are struggling with mathematics, the children who are struggling with learning. In actual fact, I would argue that many of the gifted young people in some schools are also excluded because they are struggling, because they are not being given the right challenge. They are not being given the right opportunities. They are not being helped and um, to develop and allow those talents to bloom, as the title of the conference talks about. In what ways does my planning account for all learners' specific needs? Again, if we are wanting teachers to think about these young people, they need to be asking themselves questions like this. And as you can see, the questions build on complexity as they go along through the developing stages. So the idea of mentoring teachers becomes very important. Our teachers work, qualified teachers work with our student teachers on their placement. Managers work with teachers. A key point at every part of the, 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 um, the lifespan of a teacher for support and opportunity to be thinking about our gifted learners and ensuring that we are doing what we can for them in our classes. As we come into the, the last um, part of our, our time this morning, then I want to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in our university. Some of this work is not deliberately designed or initially deliberately designed to work with high ability learners. But I want to share with you work that is going on and that as it has been developed, the um, researchers and the teachers in the schools involved have started to think about and the challenge that these opportunities can offer. My colleague there with the black and white on, Lavinia, has been working in a school, working um, with teachers on this idea as robots, as companions. And they went in to use robots part of our, our society, a part of who we are and how we're developing as people. And they wanted to look at how they could increase pupils' confidence within reading and also in STEM skills. Many of us involved in work with around STEM and how we can um, 
support and help and challenge young people with STEM skills. They went in, she worked with them. You can see the child, some of the children there with her. They're aged about seven and eight years old, primary three and primary four. And they were paying particular attention to the robots used in the classroom and how the young people responded to the robots and what the pupils want from their interactions with the robots. They had great fun, but it was more than just about great fun. It was about looking um, to see how they could develop pedagogical approaches to integrate robots into that learning process. And within that, this project, I was talking to Lavinia and I was asking about, OK, so this is about confidence in reading. What about children who are already confident in reading? What about those children who have been reading since they were two, two and a half, three years old? How can this work that is being done here be used to challenge and develop those learners? And so looking at how we're taking what we're doing and thinking, OK, so what? So what might this mean for our gifted learners? And this was one project that my university has been involved in recently, where they're using technology, pedagogy, developing a co-developing a pedagogical approach that has the potential to challenge gifted young learners in the classroom. Another project a colleague has been involved in is around children's literature in critical contexts of displacement. My colleague Evelyn Arazipe, who is herself Mexican but working and living in Glasgow, working with colleagues in Egypt and also in um, Scotland and using books, using picture books in order to challenge and to um, develop learners. Now, this is a really, really interesting project. And if you are interested in, in literacy, if you're interested in picture books and children's literature, then there is a lot of work being done in this area, particularly in my university. Um, but I just wanted to share this project with you. You can find it online if you Google children's literature. Um, in critical contexts of displacement. And this project started with a simple gesture of placing a picture book into children's hands in communities that have experienced vulnerability in its many forms. These displaced children that I mentioned in that slide uh, about UNICEF, you know, the gifted children that are coming to our countries, them, where we need to think about them. This project offered a wonderful opportunity to start to work with young people of all abilities, including gifted um, children. And so these picture books were put into the hands of children. I've run workshops on using picture books for gifted education, for gifted children. And often teachers say, but, but these are children who can read. These are children who can read very complex texts and you're giving them a book with no words in it. Picture books are a wonderful source and resource that can be used with children and with gifted young people. And in this project with these communities, they explored the power of picture books and storytelling and started gathering around them the informal and uh, formal stakeholders who wanted to carry the work forward. Because learning doesn't just happen in schools, learning happens in communities too. And so this was another project that my university was involved in, where it was around um, not initially about high ability or about gifted education, but where in talking with these researchers, they've begun to think about those children. And I strongly believe it's important that we work across education, that we work with education research, that we bring our expertise in giftedness to these other projects in order that we can enhance and elaborate and make richer these projects that are ongoing. Another example was around our work with our student teachers. So this is Claire on the left of the picture and Gabriella on the right. And they both work in STEM. They lecture in um, STEM subjects uh, of our, and lecture our student teachers do a lot of work with them as they're out in placement in schools. And they set up a project around virtual reality. 
creating opportunities not only for our undergraduate and postgraduate students to use, but also for the young people who were out in placement and therefore the teachers too. Again, this wasn't started as a project for gifted and talented, but as they've been working with the young people, they've started to see opportunities in and ways that they can challenge. And what was particularly exciting about this project is that this is working directly with our students and allowing them to think about how they can use this technology in order to challenge all learners. They won a Learning and Teaching and Innovation Award for their work in this project. They also took this project and they have developed a joint project with ISER Pune in India. And there's been a wonderful opportunity for our students in Glasgow and the students in India to come collaboratively to work on an engineering design process for primary and secondary schools. Again, it was around things like sustainability that we're having to think about in our curriculum here in Scotland anyway. And this particular project offered a wonderful opportunity for the students to come together. I'm arguing strongly in this presentation for this bridging of this nexus, for looking at ways that we can connect and bring the rhetoric and the reality together to ensure that what we do in school is challenging and encouraging our young learners, our young gifted learners. And I believe that projects like this when we start to get, get not just the specialists in gifted education to think about gifted education, but when we can start to get all of our colleagues to think about giftedness, to think about the children who just get this, who make those connections, then I think we have an opportunity to do great things. Another project is called We Beasties. We is a Scottish word for little and beasties are bugs. This project is around widening participation and combating climate change as well. Widening participation is about making sure that our gifted and talented young people come and think about coming to universities. Because if you think if you're still with me or if you weren't here at the beginning, I shared some quite shocking statistics around poverty in Scotland. And if you're in a deprived area and you're gifted, then often your life chances are limited. You don't think about coming to university. And so we are very interested in how we can change that mindset, how we can help young people to think that actually I am gifted and talented. I could have the opportunity to go and study at university. Catherine Reid, one of our PhD students here, who is specialising in gifted education within her PhD, is working on this project that's designed for eight to 12 year olds in Scottish primary schools, although we're looking at extending that, by the way, so watch out for that one. But they're going to invent their own wee beastie. They're going to learn about climate change. And then we're inviting them to come to the university, either physically in real time or virtually through the wonders of technology to help them study and research how they can combat climate change in order to support their wee beastie who's being affected by climate change. We know that offering opportunities to young people is hugely powerful. We know that raising their um, expectations, raising and challenging them and saying, no, you can come to university is a hugely important thing. And projects such as this can be a really powerful tool to raise those expectations, to raise uh, opportunities and, and to, to give and offer opportunities for young people. Again, I'm very interested in how we can ensure we're not wasting talent, that we're not wasting opportunities for young people. And I think we do waste opportunities if we're not encouraging our young people to think about the future, to think about the abilities they have and to challenge them and to say, yes, if university is the right place for you, come and study with us. As part of Catherine's PhD research, she's actually talking to young people who have come from areas of deprivation and who are in university now. 
and she's finding out some really interesting things. In fact, we're presenting at the European Council for High Ability Conference in, in, uh, at the end of August, and she'll share more of that work. You can catch her there if you're interested. But many young people unsure what goes on at a university. Part of developing gifted education for us in Scotland has been about demystifying what goes on at university. And I'll share with you something we're doing just very shortly in relation to that, that has a, a gifted focus as well. So this project is helping young people to imagine their beastie and themselves at university and considering if university could be part of their future. As I say, Catherine would love to hear from you um, and she's always looking for people to, to talk to about that work. We're very interested in STEM, as many of you will be at this conference too. And we've been very much engaged in the idea of citizen science, engaging the communities in science. And this has been a wonderful project that my college colleague, Rhea Dunkley, has been engaging in called Spot a Bee. We know the importance of bees for our, um, our, our uh, life cycle, and we know that bees are in danger. And so this pack was developed with the, the um, aim of getting young people out, spotting bees, wherever they are, the country, the city, peri-urban areas, wherever, um, and also helping them to become scientists, getting them to record, take pictures, and to put that information, upload it into this website about Spot a Bee. So helping real scientists to do real science through citizen engagement. It came into its own during lockdown and there was a wonderful pack, activity pack designed for homeschooling activities. Now, what's been interesting is again, working with Ria. We ran a workshop uh, last year where we, we concentrated on, on three projects actually, but this particular project was the one that Ria was involved in. And we concentrated and said, okay, so this is a great project. How can we make it great for gifted education? And one of the things that has caught Ria's attention is that there are young people who come back again and again and again, who are uploading information, who are asking good questions. Now, we don't know if those young people are gifted and talented, but those young people, many of them are starting to to display signs that might suggest that there is something here we would want to investigate. And what's important for me is that this young person, this not sorry, not young person, this researcher, uh, Ria, who's developing this, is now actively thinking about gifted education and opportunities. So you can record your results and see if your country has been recording results and uploading them. It started in the UK, but it is now worldwide. It would be great to see more dots there from countries that are represented here um, today at the, the conference. As I say, a great opportunity for citizen science and a great opportunity to allow gifted young people to start to be part of something big and exciting and that offers challenge for them too. In my own work, I've been trying to do the joining of the dots. I've been trying to bring together these kinds of projects that are ongoing and injecting into them the idea of gifted education, challenging our researchers, challenging our teacher educators and saying, well, OK, great. But what about? How have you thought about? How can we use this too? So challenging, asking those questions, joining the dots between the research and the practice and the policy, joining the dots between those who are working in the field of autism and high ability, getting them to bring these things together. I've been doing a lot of raising awareness with teachers, but also within our university. Because when you come to university, we don't always then challenge young people at university appropriately. And some of the work that Catherine's been doing, as I was saying to you, with this widening participation group, they, these young people came into university and sometimes they're still not being challenged at the way they or at the, the level that they were expecting. So um, I'm starting to, to ask questions within the University of Glasgow, but I think bigger questions need to be asked generally within universities. How are we challenging our gifted students that come to us? 
what are we doing? It's not enough to have them wait till third year when they can maybe go off and do some project on their own. We're going to lose them. We need to think gifted education needs to not be something different, in my view, not to be something different and separate, but needs to be embedded in our education systems, whether that is kindergarten, primary, secondary or tertiary. Young people are there and we need to be actively thinking about them all the time. I've been providing support to teachers and to parents. I've done a lot of talking with parents to help them that nexus, that red thread. I've been talking to them and helping them to know how to go and talk to schools in order that schools can translate the rhetoric into reality. And I've had some lovely conversations with parents who've then spoken to the school and the schools then come back to speak to me. And that's where we've been able to get into the idea of talking about what do you do? The so what question, what do I do? And bringing that all together. That for me is where you start to work in that nexus, where you're bringing things together and impacting on practice to make the rhetoric turn into a reality that is good and supportive. Our big ARC, our Advanced Research Centre at the University, we're spending a billion pounds on redeveloping our campus and our one of our crown jewels is our Advanced Research Centre and our Nobel Prize chemistry winner opened that centre for us just recently. But we don't want it to be something that's hidden and just for researchers in the university. We want it out there. We want the public to know about it. We want to engage the public in our research. And so we put in a bid to host 14 events in September in our a festival of festivals, we're calling it, that's all around sustainability, peace and advocacy and the Scottish Network for Able Pupils um, well, I'm coordinating the, 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 the event the, for a start off, but there are specific events running in that um, suite of, of activities, looking at gifted children, looking at teachers, helping them to support learners. And we're getting learners physically into our university talking about raising attainment. Other work that I just thought I would share with you. Um, the University is uh, of Glasgow, of course, is an international university. We have many links with many universities across the world. Um, and I'm delighted to have links with Taiwan Normal University and also recently developed links with Southern Taiwan University of Science and Technology through Professor Pin. And Professor Pin is another example of some of the work I've been doing where he's been working in early years, an area of great interest and passion of mine. And he's not been thinking about gifted education, but he's recently been in Scotland on um, a, a visit with us, a visiting um, a lecturer, um, professor with us and we've had many discussions around gifted education and he's currently working um, in nurseries in Taiwan and we are uh, looking at developing, in fact we have a, a paper that we're working on and together and talking about work that will continue uh, now he's back in Taiwan and how we can develop um, that aspect of gifted education. So I do believe that we need to connect globally. As we are still in the pandemic, we're not out of it yet, as we're working through it, I do believe that educators can help our world recover. And I do believe that working with young people and families, we can make a difference. Together, and I think conferences like this that allow us to come together, to hear those different perspectives. For many of you, Perhaps what I'm saying, you're thinking, I'm not sure how or even if that would work in my country or how or if that would work in my context. But currently for where we are in Scotland, for who we are in Scotland, for a country that thinks of itself as egalitarian and therefore doesn't like to think of somebody getting above themselves or being seeing themselves as better as anybody, that's hugely problematic for gifted education. So therefore, I want gifted young people to just be part and parcel of Scotland, to be part and parcel of Scottish education. I want them to be thought about as teachers are working in education. Therefore, I have come at gifted education in a particular way. 
And I believe that that, that is how um, I'm contributing to Scotland, but it might not work in your country. But there's maybe some little bits of things I've said in there that have got you thinking that I hope you can take away, whether you're a researcher, a teacher, a parent, whatever capacity you're here at this conference, I hope there's something you can take away, just a little thing, and go and think about in order that you become a world changer. Because I think and truly believe that through education and teacher education and teachers as educators, we can lay foundations for a better future. And my goodness, you just need to look at sometimes at the news headlines to know that we need a better future. And our future has to include and be and involve gifted young people, not because they've got all the answers, not because they're going to solve the world's problems and planet, the, the world, the planet, sorry, the problems that the planet has, but because they are part of who we are as human beings on this planet. And we need them and they need us. We need to come together. Researchers need teacher educators, teacher edu educators need researchers, teachers need, need all of that. We need to work in this together. We need to get out of our silos. We need to talk and share with each other. And these skills and knowledge and values that you bring will be crucial to our recovery in this planet, on this planet. So, as I close, the policy practice nexus. The connections, the links, the tie, the yoke, the knot, the bond, the ligament connects the core and ligature, bringing together the rhetoric, the brigadoon, if you're still with me with that analogy at the beginning, the mythical village. This is what we'd like to be. This is what we're striving to be through our policy, through our commitment to being inclusive and so on in Scotland. But that reality that works for some, but doesn't work for all. So bringing the rhetoric and through the research and the practice into the classroom, making sure we are being that red thread that connects. I strongly believe it's when we do that, it's when we are working like that in and through gifted education, that we do truly have the power to make the rhetoric become reality. So keeping on asking that big so what question, what bit of information, what bit of research, what bit of knowledge do you bring that allows the teachers to then go, okay, very interesting, so what, so what do I do? So for 40 plus years, I've been a teacher educator. I've tried to help and transform things, transform education. I'm not making any great claims that I have changed the world, but a bit like that teacher, I've tried to change the world one teacher at a time. And that makes a huge difference to young people. So as you continue in your conference, I wish you all the very best. I really, my, my wish is that we come together, that we work together in order to make gifted education um, a thing that is just there and part and parcel. We shouldn't have to fight for gifted education. Gifted young people are part of who we are. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you. Um, I hope there's something there that you can take and work with. Thank you so much. Thank you for your very informative speech from multi-layered, inclusive, and the practical perspectives on education of the gifted. So there is nothing either good or bad, no rose without a song. And so this kind of multi-layered, inclusive, and the practical discussions are very crucial, as you said. So we've got limited time, but uh, I want to open one or two questions from the audience. So if uh, you would like to raise questions, uh, please turn on your microphone on the camera for the presenter. Thank you. Also, of course, you can leave your questions uh, through chat box. I've talked you into submission. 
<laughs> okay, so I think the uh oh is there anyone in in the conference room? Yeah. yeah. Is there any question that uh, you want to raise? Your host, Professor Margaret Sutherland, they gave her email address on the PowerPoint, so you can send her email or her question uh, through email later. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, brief uh, my comment. So your presentation was mainly about the education in Scotland today, but based on your experience of a variety of contexts, every word was very strong and kind. And uh, I think uh, the, your presentation is well fit in the sustainable development goals, SDGs as well. And uh, I felt your passion to leave no one, no able child behind. So I think the nexus, nexus in your speech title is a rhetoric or analogy of teacher. So teachers make, can make rhetoric or reality. So Professor Sutherland's speech leave us a sustainable and equitable perspective to overcome the challenges we face. So please give the Dr. Sutherland a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. We hope to see you in person in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can see, I think somebody has contacted me in the chat. If you've messaged me, I think there's a question about working in science high schools, in particularly in the Philippines, please feel free to email. Um, I would be more than happy to to follow up um, anything with people um, at all. But thank you so much for the opportunity to to share about teaching and teachers, which is is my passion. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for um, chairing this session too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Professor Sutherland, and thank you, Professor Sumida.